Thanks everyone for having me. My biological journey started over 35 years ago in conventional agriculture, a little bit in organic, and also in the turf grass industry. I kind of look at myself a little bit as a conventional grower or conventionally minded um, that leans a little towards the organic practices. So with that being said, we're going to talk today about the impacts of soil biology and plant nutrition. So I've worked with a lot of different crops over the years. I've worked with tree fruits, trees, row crops, and even a lot of specialty crops. This is one of my favorite. My daughter and my wife are always very excited just prior to harvest of this crop, right around Thanksgiving. And so love to see the candy corn come off the vine. But anyway, let's be a little serious here and get started. So we're gonna concentrate on nutrition is key in the biological process. There's so much more that goes on today, but today, with biology and benefits to not only the soil and the plant and actually even to you as a grower, but we're gonna to concentrate today specifically on the nutrition side of it. So our topics today are gonna to be PGPRs, a little bit on the rhizophagy cycle, uh, nitrogen and endophytic, basically endophytes and nitrogen. We're gonna look at phosphorus solubilization. And if we have time, we're gonna go into root exudates. So as we get started down this biological agriculture process, we have to remember that it takes time. Um, it's a process that we can't really rush. Uh, nature kind of works in our own time frame, but we can certainly do a lot of things to kind of speed that process up. And it's a process with multiple moving parts. We have to remember that. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to go out there with a biological application for your soil to uh, help with nutrition uptake like we're gonna talk today. And then finally, uh, two days later, come out with the fungicide application, which is going to kill everything we did. Not only are we not gonna get the results that we want, but we're also wasting money. So we have to kind of look at how this all fits together and how these changes can build upon each other if we use these in the right order, in the right sequence. I'm not saying we can't use some of these conventional uh, practices such as uh, a fungicide when uh, needed based off of environmental conditions as we move through this biological process, but having an understanding of how everything works is gonna be critical. And these changes are not only going to be in the plants and the soil, we're gonna obviously see tremendous benefits in both, but they also have to be in you as a grower in order to be successful. So as we move down this biological process and we start to build those changes upon each other, we can start reducing some of our salt-based fertilizers. We can reduce the use of our fungicides and herbicides a little bit. Um, if somebody comes to you and talks to you about they've got a biological product, which is a silver bullet, I would look very closely at this product. They're probably not being 100% upfront with you. So might take a little digging to find out what is the, uh, what really are they trying to sell there? So to get started with this, we look at both plants and microorganisms obtain their nutrition basically from the soil. So we kind of see here that the soil is down here on the base and basically biology, beneficial bacteria and fungi need that nutrition from that soil environment. Plants also need that nutrition, the exact same nutrition that the biology needs. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how this all functions together, but we can see the microorganisms need the plant for the exudates and the sugars basically to feed them and keep them alive. And they also need the soil and they share with their soil their polysaccharides, their guamelian, uh, all their soil binding particles, which will help build soil structure, give better water holding capability and nutrient holding capability. And that plant also needs that soil in order to anchor its root and feed on that microbial community within that soil environment, which is going to make that nutrition available to you. And why is that? How do plants access this nutrition? Well, plant roots are not great at extracting nutrition from the soil environment. To access these nutrients, the plants are dependent on that biological community. And the more diversity we can have with that biological community, the better nutrient cycling we're gonna have. It's kind of like the digestive system within our own gut. That's really what this is for the plant is a digestive system to break things down and make them available to the plant in a state that the plant can actually use it. And how they do that, we're gonna get into quite a bit here in just a few minutes. So today we're gonna to focus on PGPRs, plant growth promoting. All these organisms promote plant growth. 
and rhizobacteria meaning rhizo meaning root. So they're bacteria and fungi down around the root of the plant. And there's many benefits we receive from these. These benefits in on to the right here are the indirect effects. We're not really gonna talk about any of those today. We're not gonna talk about how they uh, can reduce stress, how they can reduce environmental stresses. Um, we're mainly gonna focus today on the direct effects. We're gonna focus a little bit on nitrogen fixation and phosphate solubilization, two key points. We're, uh, we can talk more about how they also do this with potassium solubilization and all the trace minerals, but we're gonna focus on just a couple of those today, give examples of exactly how this works. But to kind of look at this, let's dig into the research a little bit, a little bit of university research by Rutgers. This is Dr. James White. Unbelievable, I recommend all growers take the time, Google Dr. White. He has a tremendous amount of information out there about how plants use soil microbes to obtain their nutrition. And one of the most exciting pieces of research that he has come out with here in, in the recent years is what's called the rhizophagy cycle. And here you can see basically a root. And at the tip here, we see the root meristem. And you can see that's kind of as, as, as uh, a, a, a sieve right here where basically we can get flows in both directions. Out here at the end of that root meristem, we can see the exudates coming out of that plant which are attracting that biological community. And here the red arrows show all these little dots are beneficial bacteria, which have been kind of coaxed in through these exudates into this plant. And when it gets inside this plant root, the plant does something a little bit sneaky. It bombards it with reactive oxygens, which make that microbes cell break down. It makes them leaky. So all of that nutrition inside that microbe microbial uh, community that is now inside this root is broken down. The plant basically wrings it out like a sponge, takes all that nutrition out of the plant. Some die, oh well, and others that are inside this plant are spit back out into the soil environment through these root hairs. Now they're hungry like a bear coming out of hibernation and they start that process all over again. It's really exciting when you start to think about this and not only do we see these exudates down here and we see this fungal and bacterial community coming into the root and up here in the root uh, hairs, you can see the different blue and red being spit back out. But all of these root hairs based off of Dr. White's research are formed specifically for um, basically spitting back out these microbial communities into the soil environment where they start all over again. Bruce Tanio talked about soil microorganisms are the key link between mineral resources and plant nutrition 30 years ago. And now we have research which backs that up and is proving what we talked about and how this function actually happens. And up here you can see a picture of a root. This is corn in uh, Kansas. But you can see all these fine little root hairs coming off these main roots of the plant. All of these are sites to spit back out into that soil environment, all these beneficial bacteria and fungal community to basically start that rhizophagy cycle all over again. You can see also we have the dreadlocks here or the roster roots, all that soil particle sticking around those roots like we want. All of these are microbial communities, they're homes, they're housing that basically house these microbial communities so that this whole process can function. But it even goes one step further. Dr. White's research has showed that these microbe protoplasts are replicated within the root cells so that many clones of these internalized microbes are now made. So not only does it attract them through communication with these exudates, it brings them into the root where they're digested. All of that nutrition is taken out of them. They're spit back through those root hairs and they're actually cloned inside that root to get more of what that plant needs. And again, it, all of these root hairs are formulated specifically because of the reason to spit these replicated microbes back into the soil environment. This picture down here, you can see this green around glow around this root. This is a main root. You see all the fine little root hairs. This green glow is Bacillus subtilis. You can see how it's just surrounding that root within that soil environment. It's pretty exciting stuff. And then here's some of Dr. White's research just showing right here the middle picture. All of these are beneficial bacteria being spit back out into that soil environment that have been through that rhizophagy cycle, now going out the root hair into the soil environment to start the process all over again. 
And it's kind of cool because when you look at these guys in their normal state within the cell wall, within that soil environment, they're kind of rod shaped. But when they're hit with that reactive oxygen, you can see they swell up, they get kind of round like little balls. This is where they become leaky and all of that nutrition can be extracted out of these uh, microbial communities or the beneficial bacteria within that soil environment. The cool part about it is they kind of look like vitamins, as you can see here, and that's what we need to think of them as, as nutritional vitamins for the plant. When we start to look at the different balls, ever, or the different strains of beneficial bacteria, it, they're all kind of unique in their nutrient profile. Here you can kind of see just in general, they're a 10, 10, 2. So if they were a nitrogen fixer, they might be a 15, 2, 2. If they were a phosphate solubilizer, they might be a 10, 10, 2, or a potassium mobilizer, a 10, 2, 10. So depending on the beneficial bacteria strain within that profile, they're gonna have all a little bit different makeup. And we can see here the research done by Dr. White is showing Bacillus subtilis again. We can see that in the root of wheat seedlings, we can see a higher level of nitrogen where these strains are found and a lower level where they're not. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit. You know, you're all very familiar with rhizobia. The little nodules that are created down here on the plant, we plant these crops to basically fix nitrogen within that soil environment. But research shows now that if we actually add diversity of that microbial community, in this case, uh, Bacillus megatherium, we get a 31% increase compared to just rhizobium alone. And we'll talk a little bit based off phosphorus solubilization of why that is true. So plant-driven nitrogen fixation is the rhizobium that we were talking about, the little nodules that are created on the plant. Today, what we're gonna talk about is those free living nitrogen fixers. These are the ones that live in the soil environment around that root profile and they're creating atmospheric nitrogen made available to the plant. Now we know as they take and make that nitrogen within the soil environment through that rhizophagy cycle, they can break that down and make that available to the plant and they can cycle this nutrition. The process happens again and again and again, but it doesn't end there. We also have endophytic nitrogen fixers, which are inside the plant. And these live inside the plant. They uh, pierce the root, go inside the plant. And it's estimated that 30% to 50% of the total nitrogen can be made available through this uh, cycle uh, within nitrogen fixation within that soil environment. So when we start to look at those endophytic nit uh, nitrogen fixers, you can see they're in the root, they're in the stem, they're in the leaves. Here you can see the discoloration of the blue and the orange. These are all nitrogen fixing bacteria with inside the stem of this plant. Down here on the bottom right, you can see this is a leaf. The green glow is nitrogen fixers. In the stem, you can see inside the stem here, we have the nitrogen fixers. Up here in the primary root, we can see all that nitrogen fixation which is going on. So it's just amazing how much nitrogen can be fixed by these plants within the soil environment. But it doesn't stop there. It actually also happens with phosphorus. Phosphate uh, solubilizing bacteria basically do the exact same thing, can break that phosphorus off and make it available to the plant. Again, this is showing research. This is Bacillus subtilis again with the wheat seedling, showing higher levels of phosphorus within that root than with no bacteria. And part of that is because uh, phosphate solubilizing bacteria, PSB, can nullify the antagonistic effects, uh, effects of soil calcification and bioavailability of phosphorus in alkaline soil. So when we start to take a look at that, how do they do that? Remember we talked a little bit about the beneficial bacteria need the soil. They need that nutrition from the soil just like the plant needs it. Well, you can see inside these bodies, here's the Bacillus subtilis that we were just talking about. And all these little black dots are phosphate prills inside this Bacillus subtilis. And you can see these white prills here are the exact same thing. Remember we talked about uh, Bacillus megatherium when we talked about the nitrogen fixation? That's because nitrogen fixation takes a lot of energy in order for that process to happen. And phosphorus is one of the key components. Therefore, when we add Bacillus megatherium to that nitrogen fixer, we have a higher level of nitrogen fixation within that soil environment. 
And so through the rise of phagy cycle, they're taking these guys in. Again, they're bombarding them with their reactive oxygen, and they're getting all of this phosphorus out of these beneficial organisms within that soil environment. And then again, the process starts all over again. But it's just not nitrogen and phosphorus. It happens with potassium, calcium. We see it with trace minerals, manganese, zinc, and the process goes on and on and on. But we have to remember, in order for this entire process to work, these organisms need an actively growing plant. And the system runs on photosynthesis. Not only the plant, but these organisms are dependent on that plant photosizing this to put those exudates down into that soil environment. It's kind of a food source for them to get them up and going to get the things that the plant needs. So remember we talk about those exudates being sugars? Well, they're really much more than sugars. Plants communicate with microorganisms through metabolic exudates by the roots. So they are communicating. Remember we talked about how if the plant needs more phosphorus, it'll call on those phosphorus solubilizers through those root exudates. It'll then basically colonize them, bring them into the plant, clone them within the plant, and spit them right back out into that soil environment. So this is what we talk about when we talk about the plants, the soil, the microorganisms, all functioning together within that soil environment to uh, supply nutrition, not only for the microorganisms of the plants, and also to help build soil structure and basically overall soil health. And it doesn't end at that. These uh, exudates are much more than just sugar. These are both the primary and secondary metabolites that we'll talk about in another uh, webinar at a, in a future day. But with that, I want to remind everyone to test, don't guess. Photosynthesis is a key to balanced nutrition. And in order to have balanced nutrition, we have to start with that microbial community within that soil environment, which takes all these nutrients and gives them to the plant, and thus they give them to us as food. And we see this here in the root exudates, the entire diagram, nitrogen fixation, phosphate solubilization, root exudates, and stress reductions. Thanks everybody for joining me.